we I had a, a a condo and it had zero electricity and had zero water. I mean, I mean, I literally had to I literally had to take a shit in plastic bags because I don't have any water. I didn't have any electricity. Like <laughs> that's what it and the and the reason is is because my previous startup tanked. I lost everything. Um, I lost. Let's just put it this way. I lost millions of dollars. But I think that type of experience creates a grit, creates a perseverance that cannot be manufactured. It is all that type of understanding of life is born through abject hardship. Thanks for listening to the Great F Podcast. Great, 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 great podcast. We meet inspiring people from around the world. Around the world. gentlemen, we are preparing to make our final descent into the Gray Avenue. The local time is what it is, and the temperature is good degrees. This is where curious minds, entrepreneurs, daredevils, hustlers, and problem solvers converge. On your left is the world of productivity and success, home of the unicorns themselves. For your safety and comfort, please remain seated with your seatbelt fastened until the captain turns off the fastened seatbelt sign. On behalf of the entire crew, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Gray Ave Podcast. We are also on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher Radio. Rate and write us a review. You can also download each episode on www.grayjabessi.com. Enjoy the show. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? My name is Gray, and this is another episode of the Gray Avenue Podcast. And as always, today we have an exciting guest, uh, and this is a podcast that you guys will definitely enjoy. And here's why we have Peter Saddington today as our guest. And Peter is a scientist, certified scrum trainer, an angel investor, and a cryptocurrency enthusiast. And man, they, we discussed a lot of things here. And some of you might know Peter as uh, bite sized Bitcoin on YouTube. So he's known um, in the startup world as a Scrum expert. Uh, so we definitely discuss about Scrum and Agile and startups. He himself started about uh, 14 startups in which 10 of them failed and he had a few exits. So we definitely talk about that. And uh, he actually holds three master's and a master's degrees in counseling and organizational behavior, another master's in education and cognitive learning theory, another master's in divinity, focusing on religion and apologetics. So he's definitely, uh, a, you know, how can I put this? He's definitely an academic and he has a passion for learning, which is um, a subject that we discussed here. We, we discussed education and learning. Uh, you know that question of like, should one go to college or not? Uh, we discussed startups, Scrum and Agile. And for more, you can read his book, which I will add uh, in the uh, in the show notes. You need to check out. He has wrote a few um, a few books, but one that you can find is the Agile Pocket Guide by Peter Sutton. You can definitely find it on Amazon. So that's one thing that we covered. And we also discussed his 14 startups, which some of them failed, uh, like I said. And he's a parent of two. Uh, he has two kids and we discussed parenting. That, uh, what led us into parenting was actually the education subject. And we talk about discipline lifestyle, which he gave a lot of gold, which got, you guys can pick up from that. I learned a lot from him and how he thinks uh, about discipline and a lifestyle of an entrepreneur. And we talk about does work-life balance work? Does it really exist? Wow, your answer is going to blow your uh, His answer is going to blow your mind, definitely. So this is a two-episode um, a two chapter episode let's put it that way okay uh the first one we covered all these things that i've just told you right now and the next one we talk about bitcoin because he is also the founder of bite sign uh sorry like i said he owns the youtube channel but size bitcoin and he's a, a miner in the cryptocurrency 
uh, space and he is the founder of um, the Bitcoin pub which you guys can check it out the, the Bitcoin dot pub uh, it's one of the most interesting and the coolest uh, forum about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies so the next episode will be about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, which I know most of you want to learn a lot. And P Peter is the right guy to learn from about this. He bought Bitcoin when it was only $2 in 2011. So I hope you guys enjoy this. And remember to subscribe and write me a review on iTunes and all these kind of things. And share the podcast as well. Um, surely some of your friends and family want to hear this as well. Okay, I'll see you on the next one. Uh, please enjoy my conversation with Peter Saddington, a.k.a. the Dodge Lord, a.k.a. Bite Size Bitcoin. Checked out some uh, some of your stuff during my research. You built oh. about 14 or it was it 12 companies and 10 of them failed. Can you what are the correct numbers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've been a startup entrepreneur since 97 of sorts and I've built 12 startups and all uh, 10 of them have epically failed, but two of them have been successfully acquired privately. So uh, I think that's a pretty good batting average. Uh, the whole idea is just execution in numbers. So the more that you execute, the more that you learn, the faster you learn. And so part of the kind of the philosophy of my life is how can I execute as fast as possible so that I can learn as fast as possible so that I can make better informed decisions on my next startup. So it's just a constant, constant iteration of how can I improve and improve and improve and improve and hopefully eventually you hit the jackpot, which I was fortunate enough to do a couple of times. Okay. What, what, well, tell me the ones that succeeded first. What, uh, what were Great. they all about? So the first one that was succeeded succeeded was a product company it was a it was an application a b2b a business to business application that helped teams uh, software development teams better understand the relational dynamics so it's a it was a scientific program of sorts helping teams and companies understand how to optimize their uh, human resources and be able to move people into better and more creative and productive roles. So it was an internal survey of sorts that helped teams understand, hey, how, how does this team of 10 people work together? And how can we, what levers can we pull to help them um, engage better, communicate better with each other? So it was an enterprise tool based on behavioral science that we sold. Uh, the second one was a consulting company. So I built uh, a consulting company on organizational design here in Atlanta. And uh, we, I think it was in 2014, I believe, or 2000, yeah, I think it was the 2014. Yeah, I think it was 2014 where we won best training company in the Southeast. And so that, that got a lot of press, a lot of press coverage, and uh, eventually uh, a company out of Colorado ended up acquiring my company, uh, my consulting company. So I sold a consulting company and I sold a product company. So, you know, so you have been in the uh, management side of things a lot. I guess that's why you're into Scrum and all these kind of things. Absolutely. So it, it is quite kind of difficult to sell, to sell a concept or a company that is, you know, is, you, you're all about management. It's a service as much, um, right. not, not product too much. What are the things that actually, what are the pitching points that could make someone buy a, like a management company or a consultant, a consultant company? Well, the, the best way to really prove that your management consultancy or your, your services company is really valuable is proof of work, which is really which makes sense when it comes to Bitcoin, but it really is proof of work. Does the model work? Is there valid internal reliability and external reliability from customers as well as internal people to your company? It, it does it does the model work? Does does it do the frameworks and methodologies that you've created? Do they actually help companies improve their bottom line? Do they help reduce risk? Do they help improve quality? Do they help improve quality of life? Do they help improve the speed to delivery in terms of product? And so, being able to prove that over multiple years and showing that hey the constructs and the framework and the methodologies that I've created actually work with companies. And these are not just small companies, these are large conglomerate, your Fortune 50, your Fortune 500 companies. And once we prove the model works, then obviously large companies uh, were very interested in talking with me about acquiring mostly, not, not, not the business of sorts, but more around the IP, the intellectual property that I created uh, for my company. That's what they were more interested in, is how can we take these frameworks and sell them to a larger audience? All right. So let's break it down now to like Scrum is one of the things that you're known for. for how, sure. how do you break that down? Like what is Scrum to, some, uh, to somebody who has no idea what it is? 
That's that. That's a long question, but so but I I am willing to answer. So, uh, Scrum was the let's 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 go back in history. In nineteen in 1970, there was a guy named Dr. Winston Royce who wrote a seminal paper on the management of complex systems, and in this paper he described what you shouldn't do, which is more of a waterfall lockstep mechanism where you know you start with design. Then you go to development, then you go to QA, then you get to go to deployment. And in 1970, he wrote this paper, and on page two, he had a figure of basically a waterfall or a lockstep mechanism. It said under that, it said figure two implementation steps to deliver a large computer program to a, a to a company. After that, he wrote about iterative, iterative development for the first time, and this was in 1970. And then in 1986. Uh, there was uh, Takeuchi and Nonaka from Japan wrote a seminal, another seminal paper called the, uh, the New New Product Development Game. And in that, they espoused this idea of iterative development and Scrum. Then in the middle, in the, middle of the 90s, Ken Swaber and Jess Sutherland, uh, the co-authors of Scrum, created Scrum as a framework. So Scrum actually came before Agile. The Ad Agile came out in 2001 in Snowbird, Utah. And so what Scrum essentially is, is a faster development framework for building products and services. And so it really started back in the 70s. It grew in the 80s and 90s and was really substantiated as a valid mechanism for delivering products and services faster. Early in the, I guess the early 2000s to 2000s to about 2007 is when it really got its heyday, and that was the time that I was moving into becoming an, you know, being a full entrepreneur, building stuff, building startups, and so I was always looking for, hey, how can I build products faster? Are there better ways to build products faster? And I came across uh, Scrum and Agile, and I found it worked not only ridiculously effective on my own startups. But I found that it could also work at the enterprise as well, and so I ended up creating a consultancy around it. Right. I know there's a lot of I know there's a lot of history. <laughs> I know a lot about it. Uh, okay, then you you have uh, sort of explained what it is. Now, could you explain what Agile is? So Agile is a kind of a philosophy. It's a it's a philosophy of sorts. Uh, started in 2000, 2001 in Snowbird, Utah, and Agile doesn't tell you anything about how to build products and services. What Agile just tells you is that there are better ways of thinking about building products and services. Like one of the Agile principles is business people and developers should work daily together. I mean, for us, that kind of makes sense that the business people would work with developers daily because things change all the time and we want to make sure that they're organizationally aligned. Uh, another, another Agile principle is simplicity. The art of maximizing the work not done is essential. So we believe that the simplest systems are the best systems because th things we tend to overcomplicate things. And so Agile is just a philosophy. It tells us, hey, here's how you should think about building products. Whereas Scrum is a framework, it's more of the praxis, of the practical application of how to build. So right. in a short form, Agile is the why we should think differently, Scrum is this is how you do it. So it's like uh, um, Agile is the blockchain and... <laughs> <laughs> Ad, yes, Ad, Ad, Agile, would be, Agile would be Bitcoin. Agile would be Bitcoin, okay. um, and and Scrum would be all the altcoins coins. of how you actually apply it into different economies at scale and different markets. Yeah, so that's a good analogy. Yeah, Agile's like Bitcoin, and Scrum is like how is is different offshoots of Bitcoin in terms of the altcoin market. That's a pretty good example. Sounds good. And you're a trained scientist, right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. But then how I'm curious to know how you made the transition for did you work in a lab at all or you just moved from? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I worked in a lab. So I have uh, so I am a trained scientist. So I have three master's degrees. I have a master's in counseling and organizational behavior. I have a master's in education and cognitive learning theory and a master's in uh, divinity focusing on religion and apologetics. So uh, I have been in it's 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 we it's weird saying it coming out of my mouth but i mean i have constantly been a self starter uh in a, a self you know someone who is constantly wanting to learn i consider it kind of like a genetic disease um if there was if there was no issue with money and no issue with family which you know i got a wife and two kids uh i would literally be just I would be in university the rest of my life. That's all I would do is just learn, 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 and use all that learning to build products and services. So I mean, that's I just love learning, and I have a huge student debt uh, number oh. to prove it. 
<laughs> okay, that one, it, it, that's a bummer right there. That's why I got to invest in Bitcoin. That's why I got to buy my Bitcoin. Man. I got to pay off that student debt. Right. So, you know, one, so that's fascinating to me because I love learning as much. Learning is fun. You know, I'll do it all day. Uh, but obviously, we need to pay bills and blah, blah, blah. But one of the things now uh, is, and I actually we discussed this subject on this podcast with a couple of entrepreneurs before. Now, why do you... Okay, there's always the skepticism. I'm, I'm skeptical of, on spending too much time in university uh-huh. or with, with all the debt that comes with it. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical. Like, what's your view on that? Because it seems like the dynamic of having to go to college or not, it's, it's pretty much of a choice these days as compared yeah. to, to back in the day when, when it, was like, it was the only way to actually get things happen. You know, I, I have a... It's, it's a great... That's a great question, Gray. Um, I, I really have a love-hate relationship with education. Number one, I love education because as a self-starter, I'm constantly reading tons of books on my own. Sure. I, in, in many ways, um, and I don't think I'm overstating this, I mean, in many ways, I have to be more educated. I have to be smarter than my clients. If, if I'm not more educated or smarter than my clients, then there's no reason for them to pay me sure. for me to help them build products and services. So there's actually some self-interest there. But the same at the same time, I feel like, now people might correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like the democratization of information in today's world, mm-hmm. meaning the free access to education in today's world is only going to expand by the time you know my children are of college age. And I would go as far as to say that they sh- they won't need to go to college if sure. two things two things are there. Number one, they are self starters, right? So if they're self starters, then they don't need to be forced to go to a brick and mortar university. They can go take an online class and they can learn at their own pace. So number one, they have to be self starters, and number two, they have to have some vision for their life, right? When you don't have vision for your life and you don't have and you are not a self starter, you should go to a brick and mortar school that will force you to learn something, learn some go sort ahead. of trade, learn some sort of trade. And so for me, I didn't really have a good vision for my life. All I really knew is that I'm I love learning. I don't mind spending money to go to get the education. I love helping people, and that's all I really knew. And I and I love building products and services. So that's really all I knew. So I was con- using education as a mechanism to really just find myself as I was building startups. Sure. But I think for, for in the future, I think a lot of people might not need it. I, I think it's to be honest. I think most undergraduate ed, uh, degrees are worthless. Yeah. Uh, you know that you know the most important thing that I picked up from what you said is that it it, it actually depends from person to person because oh, yeah. you know I think both sides right now um, are overstated. I mean, I still believe that most people still have to, to go to college. You know, it's really yeah. hard to not most people are like you know are self starters. They can just learn things on their own. But you know, there's always now <laughs> the question about money as well on on the other side. It's, Wait, it's being well, overpriced in a way, you know. I, you know, I I don't think, and again, this is my opinion. Mm. But if we if we if 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 what we have learned from social psychology and human systems and cultures, if we take all that learning, then really the worst time to go to college is when you're 18 to 22. I mean, in terms of your brain formation and understanding the world and mental maturity, social maturity. Like literally 18 to 22 is the worst time to be choosing a career path or choosing, uh, you know, a particular uh, area to learn and grow and become, you know, an engineer, a doctor, a psychiatrist or whatever profession. Uh, I, I think the entire kind of forcing mechanism of moving people to college at an 18 year old level is kind of stupid. Uh, mm-hmm. Because at an eight, come on, let's let's be honest. At eighteen years For old, sure. did you really know? Did you really know what you wanted to do? I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. All I wanted, to, all I knew was I wanted to make money. <laughs> you know, a, a good question to ask is actually that. Well, that I, a, a lot of I get a lot of questions from folks that are in high school. So, like, okay, uh, or if I ask them why you say you're going you're going to college uh, next year, what are you going to study? And they would tell me what they want to do, and I ask them why are you doing that. They never give you a clear answer. Obviously, it means that like they're not too sure of what's the, what they want to do. And the other thing to me is like, do you? Let's talk about the years that you spend in. in does anybody has to spend the same amount of time there? Like, do you need four years 
on average for everyone. Some people can do it in eight years. Some people can do it in two years. Some people can do it in a year. So, yeah. but, but my question is, how do you instill those uh, philosophy or your understanding now? How do you translate that to your kids, for example? Because that's hard. Where do you put them? Or how do you, <laughs> how do you get Man, them you, to be, to be self-starters? How do you do that? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, this, this is a real, these are really good questions, Gray. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways it is nature and nurture. I think there's genetic dispositions that people have towards certain things or they have leanings towards certain things. Um, I can tell you this, for example, uh, with my children, my daughter is an abstract thinker. So she is someone who can create things out of nothing in her mind um, and is able to be able to extract those those abstract ideas and make them turn them into reality. So she's a very good storyteller. She's very good at creating a scene with Legos and being able to create an entire narrative around it. Whereas my son is far more tangible. He's pattern oriented with his thinking. If you give him a very distinct pattern, he can follow that pattern and be able to give you the answer to it. Um, he's also very concrete in his thinking. So it has to be tangible, it has to be real. And when he, when he can see it, then he can manipulate it and work with his hands. But my son is not an abstract thinker. So I think there's some genetics involved with it, number one. But number two, it really is as a parent, modeling a hard work ethic lifestyle. Yeah. Um, my kids are constantly seeing that their dad is a hard worker and I work very hard for the things that I want. I work very hard to support my family. And so I think that's the nurture side of it is that they have natural inclinations or genetic dispositions towards certain ways of thinking and certain worldviews of sorts. But the nurture is really saying, hey, the nurture is the discipline, it's the foundation of, hey, hard work, no matter if you're an abstract thinker or you're a tangible thinker, uh, regardless, hard work is the undergirding that will enable you to be successful in this world. And you do not, maybe you might not need to go to university to be successful and and i think in today's world that's going to be even more the case that we're going to find many people that are are successful uh that did not go to college um and have live happy and fulfilled lives right but then you have well every parent for the most part right you always have a model of are you what... are you a parent are you a parent no 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 <laughs> <laughs> but I, I need i need i need to I'm, i always have these kind of questions you know so now you're the right guy to ask right now and you're on the spot right now <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> um you're the box mining today all right so <laughs> <laughs> now you have a model of what you want your kids to, i mean to become my parents had their own model of what i wanted to be i turned out to be a did you did you fail them uh, absolutely. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not a doctor by any means, you know, so it's like I did something. I'm the wild west of what they wanted to do. Oh, to man. In a, but it, it turned out positively, though. I, I didn't feel that very, very far. But, you know, they, they still need that sticker. They have a sticker on the car, you know, at the end of the day. And I didn't give them that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a model of what you, you, you want your children to become, you have that, too. You know, it's just a bias of like what you think is right for your children. But right. how, as a parent, do you try to distract yourself from that? Like, let them be, be what they can be, instead of you trying to. Like, if you you have a passion, toes, right? You're not, yeah. You have a passion for cars. I know that, and your little Dodge has car toys everywhere. <laughs> Yo, that's a genetic disease. That's a genetic disease. I have several genetic. I have. So I'll tell you my three genetic diseases that I can clearly identify. Sure. Number one. I have an insatiable desire for knowledge and learning. I mean, it's just, you know, I was the type of kid that it, when I was younger, when everyone else was playing, I was reading books. I mean, that's all I cared about. So I have, I have a genetic disease or genetic disposition towards learning. Number two, I have a genetic dis, uh, disease or uh, genetic disposition towards data. And so date, I'm really good with data, which makes me uh, fit and form to be a scientist. As a scientist, you know, as especially as a data scientist, collecting large aggregates amounts of data, looking at patterns. So I think my son got that from me as well. Um, and number three is I have a genetic uh, disorder towards cars. Uh, my father was into cars, uh, I mean, big time. Uh, that's a story for another day. Yeah. Uh, I was, you know, love cars and my son, I mean, he was interested in cars since the day he was born. I mean, the thing that grabbed his attention when, you know, when he was just crawling around, looking out the window, he didn't want to do anything but look at, you know, cars and, and you know, big <laughs> machines moving by. 
And so, you know, those are those are kind of his his genetic dispositions as well. I, I think when it comes to imposing your will on your children, I don't think that would ever be a good answer to on in, in terms of how to raise your children. The way that I look at raising children is very simple, is that I just need to model what I consider to be the best behavior possible that will not only serve them well in society, but serve them well at home and allow them within that to understand good discipline, good self-awareness, right? The ability to be assertive, to be able to speak up. And so these are the type of things that you just try to model as a parent. And you, you frankly, I mean, in many ways, you're just trying to do your best. Yeah. <laughs> and it would turn out and something different. You never know, you know, but you, you, least, never, you never know. Yeah. You never know. I think, you know, in, in terms of the pragmatic, one of the things that, that I try to do as a father is give my children as many opportunities as they possibly can. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, it's in many in many cases you know us and our you know our, our previous generations we didn't have as many options as kids do today and so one of the things that i think is ingrained within parents is to want to give your children more opportunities than you have and mm. so certainly that's true with me as well i think that's true to me as well my parents gave me a lot of opportunities that you know i just I, i'm good at doing um being myself a lot you know i do things that i want that i feel right to me so i don't really like to be like sort of forced to do things or controlled so they allowed me to do that which i'm, I'm totally thankful for awesome awesome yeah, yeah. You know, we live in a, we live in a day-to-day -day where we have so much more opportunities and i think what is often missing from our generation and in in many ways the younger generations is just gratitude and just gratitude of what we have yeah. uh, at our disposal i mean I mean, when when I was growing up, we didn't have these things. We didn't yeah. have the world at our fingertips, you know. Mm. I mean, I, in many ways, they were just simpler days. Now I got all this crap. I got computers all over the place. It's too complicated, bro. Yeah. So now, dude, you look 16. What, what happened? What are you drinking? Are you going to share the recipe? <laughs> Yo, come on. You know Asians don't raise it. <laughs> Asians don't raise and just like just like blacks don't crack man Asians yeah, don't raisin. for sure okay so uh, let's let's just go go back to the startups a little bit and then we move into sure, Bitcoin. Sure, sure. Bitcoin now tell me more about the four startups I mean the other startups that failed why 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 did you render it as a failure and what what happened really and what did you learn from that well great great question um, fail, I don't see failure as I don't see failure as a negative I see failure as expected uh, I think when people go into business, they often go into business not expecting that they'll fail. I actually have gone into business with the expectation that I will fail a lot. Um, if we use an example of you know what I have now with the you know with the Bitcoin pub, and we're building mobile apps right now, and we're eventually going to be building our own coin in cryptocurrency. You know, the entire process of what we built from our the YouTube channel to the pub and, and now moving on to mobile apps, I mean, we've failed in multiple ways and multiple experiments. And, and and so I whenever I started a startup, I always went into it expecting that I was going to fail early, fail fast, and hopefully learn something. That's it. Just fail early, fail fast, and learn something. And I've always known that the faster you learn, the more informed decisions you'll make for the future. And so the other startups, they had a failure to launch, but I learned a ton through the building of them. And I will tell you this though, the I have seen startups that are some of the crappiest ideas that have made millions of dollars. Why? Because they have a fantastic leadership. They have fantastic leadership group. They have a fantastic leadership board. I've also seen on the other hand, you know, um, really great ideas, yeah. wonderful ideas that have tanked because the leadership couldn't get their shit together. So I think in, in many ways, the real success of a startup is the leadership team and their ability to do three things exceptionally well. Focus, number one, just focus, laser focus on the product, building the product, building the product, building the product. Forget marketing, forget marketing. If you don't even have a good product, marketing will avail you nothing. And so a hyper focus, a laser focus on the, building the product. Number two, zero, and this kind of correlates to the focus, but zero sideways energy, meaning you, the good leaders have the ability to say no. 
I say no to th things every day. Actually, I got a couple emails today where I just said, no, I'm not interested. No, I don't have the time. Um, whenever someone gives you an opportunity, if it's away from your core competency, it's away from the focus of your startup, it's going to be sideways energy. It's going to be taking away from what you really need to do. So focus, no sideways energy, saying no is awesome. And number three, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. I think where, where most people don't realize, it, I, you've probably heard this many times, but everyone wants to be in a startup. Everyone wants to start a startup. Yeah. But most people haven't been part of a startup. A real startup is when you have zero funding, you have zero interest from your peers, zero interest from your family. Everyone says it's stupid. No, nobody thinks it's gonna you know, get wings and fly. A real startup is when you put everything on the line. I got wife, two kids, and I mean, putting everything on the line where it's like, I'm going to potentially fail and lose everything. And that, and most people when they start startups, they often have one foot in one place and one foot in their startup. For sure. You're yeah. not you're not gonna you're not gonna win if you're working a part time job and you're also doing your startup. You're you're, you're not, both of those are gonna fail. And so you know most startup entrepreneur, entrepreneurs that I've met are not startup entrepreneurs. They are people who joined a startup after it had some viability and after three and a half years of the the founders grinding and making it actually a reality, uh, that's where most people sit at. But most people aren't startup entrepreneurs because they don't know what it feels like and they don't know what it, it's like to lose your house. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a story. Um, when my, before my wife and, and I were married, um, we, I had a, a, a condo and it had zero electricity and had zero water. I mean, I mean, I literally had to. I literally had to take a shit in plastic bags because I don't have any water. I didn't have any electricity. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's what. It, and the and the reason is is because my previous startup tanked. I lost everything. Um, I lost. Let's just put it this way: I lost millions of dollars. Uh, and so, for me, and and you know, that and that was your uh, bootstrap money, no VC money. Bootstrap. I, I try to bootstrap everything. I don't like taking VC money, and the reason is, is I don't like other people telling me what to do. I like that. Um, and so for me, you know, I, it's it's just surprising that my wife still stayed with me. I mean, I remember showing her the house, and she was like, uh, "There's no electricity. There's no running water." It's like, yeah, I know, because I lost everything. You still wanna you still wanna be with me? You found a nice one, bro. I, have to I know. I found a nice one. one. But I mean. And it's not to say that that's the experience you have to have, but I think that type of experience creates a grit, creates a perseverance that cannot be manufactured. It is all that type of understanding of life is born through abject hardship. And I think that's what makes real entrepreneurs successful is they've been to the bottom of the barrel. They've been to the point where they have zero dollars. I think I had like eighteen dollars in my checking account um, at the time. So, you know, coming back from that to what I have now, it just proves that I have the grit to do it and I and I've experienced it. So I know what the bottom looks like. So if I'm if I'm not at the bottom, I'm doing OK. Yeah. Yeah. But what saved you from that situation, though? It's like, did you ever try to work for other companies just like for, you know, rent um, bills money or what did you do? Um, I mean, I picked up side contracts here as a consultant to keep the bills moving, but the, they were always contracts. So I was never an FTE or a full-time employee. Uh, I, being a full-time employee to me was always too much. I, I never wanted to work for the man. Mm. I always wanted to work for myself. So I picked up side contracts to keep the money flowing, but they were they were never long. They were never long. Dude, you ain't the unicorn, brother. I like that. Don't work for the man. man. <laughs> this is why I, you can't you can't you can kind of see him. I got all these gray hairs popping out. That's where it's all coming from. All that stress. <laughs> <laughs> you survived, so we're good. We're good. All right. So you, I like I watch your videos, obviously. So I like how strategic you try to put things together. I mean, you're definitely data data scientist. Uh, you, I, I've seen some of your spreadsheets, which now before I forget, I, I su would suggest that you share them with the community. You know, like. I'm terrible sure. at, 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 at spreadsheets. <laughs> so if you could share that, that would be awesome. And behind I will, you, I will share more. Yeah. Now I can see that you have a lot of notes stacked up in, you know, in, in lines and in order. I would, I would like to know how your day is structured or like, how do you approach things? Maybe I can learn a few things or two because my, my lifestyle is kind of crazy, but it works. 
It works. I, 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 it seems what I'm about to say, Gray, may sound counterintuitive, but it is actually the best way to live. Hmm. The best way to live is a highly disciplined lifestyle. Now, I think when most people hear the word discipline, they receive a kind of a negative connotation in their hmm. mind around what that means. But I find that to be further from the truth. A highly disciplined lifestyle allows you to live fully in every moment that you have. And what I mean by that is, uh, I'll give you an example. You know, when I was going through school, doing, I was going through school, getting my master's degrees, doing research papers, doing clinicals, uh, also doing contracts, also building startups. Like, it, it's crazy. The, the times in which I was the most busy it, are the times when I felt the most alive. I mean, everything was regimented. I had to go work out at this time. I had to study from this time. I had to go to class this time. I had to serve my client this time. I had to build my startups at this time. Highly disciplined lives are very full lives. And what it creates for you is a cadence to your life. When it's, it's, it's interesting, the more time you have, let's, let me see if this resonates with you, Gray. Mm -hmm. The more free time you have, you'll find ways to fill it up with useless things to do, won't you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so a, a disciplined lifestyle says, hey, I'm going to time box this and I'm going to do this during this period. And, and, and time boxing is a great way to create discipline. It's like I'm only going to spend an hour and a half. That's all I got today to read. When the hour and a half is done, I'm done. So, for example, um, I'll show you over here. I got an egg timer. Huh. Uh, I, I, use, I use this egg timer for everything. Um, it allows me to time box what I'm doing. When the timer's up, I'm done focus on something else or take a break. Right. And so so discipline a uh, disciplined lifestyle is not only a very rewarding and fulfilling lifestyle, but actually a disciplined lifestyle is a very uh, I think it's a wealth generating lifestyle. I mean, when was it, when was the last term you heard a successful person whether it be an athlete, an artist, technologist, entrepreneur, a management, you know, when was the last time you heard a, a successful entrepreneur say, "You know what? I, I made a billion dollars because I was lazy and I just hung out all the time. No, no, no. no. no, no it's it's no. because they had a disciplined lifestyle. They focused like nothing else. They put everything in, into it. And I mean, these are the people that you're like, how do you even live? You know, I mean, I only sleep like four hours a day. Yeah, I mean, I, I sleep about five. Um, now, <laughs> what you say is really interesting because I think I get it wrong in terms of, I guess, other people as well. It's like, I look at completion. Did I finish it? But what you said mm -hmm. just now is about, okay, did I spend one and a half hours today on this? You know, then yeah. maybe you can leverage it looking at when do you need to complete that subject or what, what, whatever. So that, that's, well, let, that's pretty cool. Well, 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 let me tell you something. Well, let me tell you something wonderful. And I think this will help your viewers. The, we have as humans, we have a mental faculty that sets us apart from every other animal on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that mental faculty is called imagination. No other, no other animal on the planet has imagination. Only, only humans have the mental faculty of imagination. Uh, we are the only creatures who in the world can create out of nothing mm -hmm. something. I'll give you an example. This, that room that you were in, that room that you're in right now, that room wasn't there before. There For was sure. someone. There was someone who created that room before it was even built, and they had in their mind's eye, in their imagination, they had the final product of that room that you're sitting in today. Same thing with this. There was a guy named Steve Jobs who created this out of thin air. So here's the thing that I want to uh, lay, lay on you. We as humans have the only mental faculty in the entire world to complete something before we begin. Sure. Let that sink in. We are the only creatures in the world who can complete something before we begin. And so what makes this so powerful when it comes to startups and entrepreneurship is having a firm vision for what you want to build. Once you have that, once you've created that world, that product, that feature, that house or room or whatever you're building once you have that vision you can incrementally build towards it because you've already built it before you've even started and so that that that's a powerful powerful idea and i think a lot of people forget that they they, they say hey i gotta get started i gotta do something no 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 
begin with the end in mind. Yeah, sure. I, I, I have begin heard of that mind. before. Yeah, yeah. End goal in mind, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's. I mean, when I started, when I started the whole thing, creating the Bitcoin .pub, uh, the mobile apps that we're building, the coin. I mean, I've already built them. Mm. They're all in my mind, and yeah. I already have them. You know, outlined. I mean, what you see back there is my third book that I'm going to be publishing. Right. Um, so I've already built it all. It's all in my mind, and so it's just about how can I break. You know, how can I break certain chunks? How can I break certain parts into chunks that I can consume in a small cadence? And so I take it just half a, you know, not even half a chapter, about a quarter of a chapter at a time. I already have it all built up here. And so the key idea to any type of endeavor or any type of startup, you got to focus on the vision. What's the product vision? What's it going to be? Make yeah. it, create it. Cool. Okay. I think now it's safe that we can move into oh, but uh, you didn't answer my question how is your day structured oh. in on, on oh uh, how is my day structured it's yeah. very regimented it's very yeah. regimented well, the, the reason up... sorry the reason i asked this is now i've added gym to my schedule <laughs> so now I'm, <laughs> I'm like i'm trying to see where i can fit it in because previously what used to happen is that i would just miss it oh i'll do it tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and it never happens yeah yeah so i i have a very i have a very regimented day i'll, I'll tell you for example today you're you're kind of like a kind of my my variable for the day having this call is a variable for the day but yeah. i wake up in the morning i help get the kids off to school uh right as the kids leave for school i go to the gym and i go to the gym for an hour and a half after i come back you know i come back from the gym i shower then i work i work for another hour and a half about 12 12 30 i get lunch after lunch, I move on to the next activity. So my mornings are pretty regimented and pretty consistent because there's a lot I need to do. I need to go to the gym, I need to eat, I need to shower, I need to do some work, at least an hour and a half worth of work in the morning. Um, and then when the kids go home, I wanna spend some time with them, spend some time you know, doing some other work, having dinner. And then after dinner, when the kids are down, that's when it's just, I take it hour by hour. So I'll work from maybe about 7.30 to about 3.30 in the morning, just hour, 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 this task, this task, this video, I gotta knock out this video, I gotta do this content, I gotta research this stuff. And so it's very regimented and I go to bed uh, pretty much at three o'clock every night. Cool. Or three, uh, three, three, three through 30. Uh, what, time, what, what time do you wake up? Uh, about 6.15. Oh, geez, <laughs> dude, that's, <laughs> that's hectic. <laughs> So there's all this whole talk. I mean, I go to bed about two and I wake up at seven. So it's not bad. Yeah, there's a, uh, this whole thing about uh, work life balance, dude. That thing doesn't work for me, dude. I'm obsessed with, with hustle right now. You know, I'm, I have a lot going on. I'm going to do this and that. And there's always, you know, all over the place. Okay, you got a life, uh, work life balance, sleep eight, nine hours. I just can't. Like, how do you, how do you concept that whole? Work life balance is a is a contextual it needs work life balance needs to be contextualized to the individual. Right. And I'll give you just two examples. Work life balance works really well for a corporate employee. Mm. A corporate employee should have a work life balance, right? They they wake up in the morning, they go to a job, they slave away uh, at that job for someone else working for someone else and then they should go home about 4.35. Now, if their boss or their slave driver asks them to work till seven or eight or nine, they do not have a work-life balance. They require a work-life balance. For me, as an entrepreneur, work-life balance does not apply. It doesn't apply. You, you just balance where you can balance sure. depending on your passions, what you need to do. Um, so I don't believe that it's possible. Now, people might correct me if I'm wrong here, I don't believe it's possible to have a day in day out work life balance as an entrepreneur. I think entrepreneurs need to take breaks or sabbaticals or time off or vacations. But if you're building something and you love it, Man. you won't want to do anything else but do it anyway. For sure. So, you know, what I'm building right now with the Bitcoin pub and what I'm building with, with the, the mobile apps, the iOS and Android apps that I'm building for the cryptocurrency economy, I mean, there is no work life balance. I want to build this stuff. I want to build it now. Frankly, I wish I had built it. I wish I had started earlier. Um, and so I don't believe work-life balance can really work. I think it's a compromise that you have to accept as an entrepreneur. But as a full-time employee, you should have a work-life balance because you're slaving away for someone else and making someone else money. Rich, oh, absolutely. Um, so for the people listening, you're listening to the Grey Aft podcast, which you can check out on iTunes, SoundCloud, all over the place. 
and I have my own YouTube channel. It's called Hardcore Crypto. You guys can check it out. Hardcore Crypto. For sure. Now we're jumping into crypto. <laughs> we're going to jump into What's Bitcoin. Up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Sure. So did you make your first million in Bitcoin, if I may ask? Okay, guys, thanks for listening. I think we're going to end it there for today. And remember to check out the upcoming podcast. That's the one that contains everything about Bitcoin that Peter had to say. Remember, he bought when it was $2. And as I speak right now, one Bitcoin is $4,000. So then you can learn how he got started and how he has been transitioning over the period of time to this day. And he hasn't sold any, uh, but he has traded with other altcoins. Uh, you might, this might all sound um, alien to you, but I, I just recommend you listen to that podca podcast and then you get used to it. All right. Thanks and see you on the next one.